When most people think of the First World War, they think, most often, of either the Western Front and the trenches and flying aces, and possibly the Italian or Eastern Fronts. But the war was by no means confined to mainland Europe. And this week, we really see that it was a world war, with battles taking place on three continents. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. When we left off, the huge offensive in Champagne was in full swing, with the French losing at Soissons. In the east, the Russians were still trying to break through the mountains. In the Caucasus, the Turks were licking their wounds and blaming the Armenians, and way, way down south, South African troops were invading German Southwest Africa. Now, we've seen a few actions in both Southeast and Southwest Africa over the past few months, but there was a change in the nature of the war in Africa this week, following the Battle of Jassin on the 19th in German East Africa. See, last month, the Germans, under General von Lettau Vorbeck, had successfully defended Tanga, and now von Lettau Vorbeck headed north along the Indian Ocean coast to take Jassin, which was occupied by the British. He took it with ease, but realized something important. He had far fewer officers and far less ammunition than the enemy, and both were impossible or difficult to replace. So large-scale, direct, and decisive confrontations were no longer really an option for von Lettau Vorbeck. In future, he would focus on guerrilla operations. And over the next four years, with a force that never numbered a whole lot more than 10,000 men, he held in check well over a quarter of a million British Belgian and Portuguese troops, despite exactly zero assistance from home. Actually, one report says half a million enemy troops, but whatever the number, those troops were all prevented from helping the allies in Europe or the Middle East. Edwin Hoyt, in his book Guerrilla, makes the case that von Lettau Vorbeck's exploits were the greatest and most successful guerrilla operations in history. He may well be right. And speaking of the Middle East, there was some action there that I didn't have time to mention last week that I will mention now. Eleven days ago, British and Indian troops had successfully defended Muscat from forces loyal to the Imam of Oman. Muscat was ruled by the Sultan Taimur, but the British, who saw it as an important port in the region, financed the Sultan and in return expected the Sultan to keep other powers out of the area. But both Muscat and Oman had a lucrative rifle trade across the Persian Gulf, and when the British tried to centralize and control this trade in Muscat, it pissed off the Omanis to the point where Turkish and German influence could intercede and convince the Imam to attack. This was just one early round in a long British fight against German and Turkish influence throughout the region. The British would have something very new to contend with this week, though, as it saw the first strategic bombing raid on Britain by Zeppelin. Actually, the Germans had first attempted it January 13th, but the weather ruined that. So on the night of January 19th, two Zeppelins, who initially targeted Umberside but were diverted by weather, dropped their bombs on Great Yarmouth, Sheringham, and King's Lynn, killing four and injuring 16. Since this was something both new and scary as hell, it prompted all kinds of reactions and conspiracies. Some apparently believed German agents in Britain were using the headlights of their cars to guide the Zeppelins to their targets. And some rumors said the giant airships weren't coming all the way from Germany, but from secret bases in the Lake District. They had, in fact, taken off that morning from Fulsbüttel. Samuel Alfred Smith had the historical distinction of being the first British citizen to die in aerial bombardment. But while Britain might be seeing something new, on the Western Front, it was business as usual. And the business was that of killing and dying. The action was mostly in Champagne this week, as the First Battle of Artois had finally ended January 13th. There were French successes at Champagne and French progress all week at Bois des Prêtres. But here's the thing, after all these weeks and like 30 combined attacks and counterattacks so far, French troops had advanced less than a mile. Peter Hart wrote, when describing the wholly attritional nature of the Champagne Offensive, quote, Gradually, the battlefield mutated into a sort of outdoor charnel house, littered with human remains. There may not have been enough guns to create a breakthrough, but soldiers on both sides were horrified by the terrible destruction wrought by artillery on the human body, end quote. I'd like to actually throw in another quote from the Western Front here, from further north, in Messines, where a young soldier of the German army wrote to his landlord January 20th, quote, We are still in our old positions and keep annoying the English and French. 
The weather is miserable and we often spend days on end, knee deep in water and what is more, under heavy fire. We are greatly looking forward to a brief respite. Let's hope that soon afterward, the whole front will start moving. Things can't go on like this forever." End quote. Signed, Adolf Hitler. I'm sure the four years things did go on like that felt more than forever for many. Now Hitler, as many of you know, was Austrian born, and Austria was making news in the war once again this week. On the Eastern Front, the Russians had occupied the Kirilibaba Pass in Bukovina and continued advancing there all through the week. However, at the end of the week, the Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army, having been strongly reinforced, managed to retake the pass the 22nd. The following day, Emperor Franz Joseph's army, with German support, would begin its Carpathian offensive with several aims to free another Austrian army, well over 100,000 strong, from the fortress of Przemysl, where it had been under siege for two months, to drive the Russians out of Galicia and the Carpathian Mountains and prevent any advances toward Hungary, and also to make a strong show of force that would intimidate countries like Italy and Romania, who were so far neutral but were increasingly viewing Austrian military disasters with an eye to joining the Allies and gaining some imperial territory for themselves. The Russians, for their part, weren't just busy this week in the Carpathians. They were on the move on not one, not two, but three fronts. In the Caucasus, they took nearly 4,000 Turkish prisoners in Kaura Urgan in a three-day battle during a snowstorm. This was another total Russian victory over the Ottoman forces. And way up in the northern reaches of the Eastern Front, the Russian army took Skempe on January 20th, forcing the Germans to evacuate. And that's where we stand at the end of the week. With the Russians triumphing on two fronts and doing pretty well on a third, the British are attacked at home, in the Middle East, and in Africa, and on the Western Front, the French were successful, but success meant dying in droves for small temporary gains. This war was six months old, but it was already truly a world war. The only continent not yet involved in either men or actual battle was Antarctica. Just this week saw men fighting and dying on four fronts in Europe and battles on two other continents. It would only grow larger and larger. I usually end these episodes with a talk or a quote about new aspects of the horrors of modern war, which I think is good because however interesting you may find these episodes from an historic standpoint, it's important to remember that this is all about millions of people dying in some of the worst ways imaginable. Today though, I'll end with a quote, but one that's more about the future than the past. I read this in Martin Gilbert's The First World War. Quote, it would be quite easy in a short time to fit up a number of steam tractors with small armored shelters in which men and machine guns could be placed, which would be bulletproof. Used at night, they would not be affected by artillery fire to any extent. The caterpillar system would enable trenches to be crossed quite easily, and the weight of the machine would destroy all barbed wire entanglements." End quote. This letter was pretty much the first step in the evolution of the tank. It was to Herbert Asquith, British Prime Minister. It was signed Winston Churchill. Churchill was one of those larger-than-life historical figures, and we have a whole new format of episodes to document those important individuals. So click here to check out our bio episode of Ferdinand Foch, a great French general who at this point was also thinking about ways to overcome the trenches more easily. And check out our Instagram account for some cool historical pictures and a glimpse behind the scenes. And if you like our show, please subscribe. See you next week.